All right, turn with me to Psalm chapter 52, verse 6. Psalm 52, verse 6. Uh, I was planning on kicking off another series and doing a series leading up to Easter, but I'm doing a couple of standalones, which still does lead us up to, how many of y'all know Easter's two weeks away from today, right? Two weeks from today, that is correct, right? All right. And so, you know, uh, as, as we're gearing up, I want to encourage you, you know, uh, about that as well, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. So, um, uh, Psalm 52, verse 6, again, uh, I'm not going to get there yet, but last week, kind of playing off as I was just praying and getting direction last week or the next uh, few weeks. Last week, just to recap, I talked about John, uh, from John 15, how Jesus used the example of vine. He was the vine, we we're the branches, and how we need to stay connected to him, right? I showed you from the text that when we stay connected to Christ, there's a process of producing spiritual fruit in our lives, Jesus said that's how we know we're truly disciples. We can say we're Christians, we can go to church, we can do all those things, but he said unless we're producing fruit, right, we're not truly his disciples, right? And so this morning I want to read from the book of Psalms and show you how King David also used agriculture as an illustration for his life and relationship with God. As I mentioned last week, you know, now spring has definitely sprung, right? You see it with either your weeds in your yard, clovers, or maybe if you like Brother Francis, you probably got a, a garden, you know, rocking and rolling right now, right? And maybe tomato plants and cucumbers, whatever the spring vegetables are, are probably coming up. And if you like that, or flowers, right? So just in this time, as I, as I looked at this and thought about this, uh, I want to continue in the, in the vein of agriculture, so to speak. But it starts out in Psalm 52, verse 1. David says this, Why do you boast about your crimes, great warrior? Do you realize God's justice continues forever? All day long you plot destruction. Your tongue cuts like a sharp razor. You're an expert at telling lies. You love evil more than good and lies more than truth. You love to destroy others with your words, you liar. But God will strike you down once and for all. He will pull you from your home and uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous will see it and be amazed. Now what does that have to do with agriculture? Absolutely nothing. But I'm setting up the story. I'm setting up this psalm. I actually wasn't going to put this in, but this morning as I was going over my notes, I felt like I needed to set it up of why David's about to say what he's going to say uh, and where we're going to camp out in today. So King David right here was referring to a situation that happened in 1 Samuel when Saul was chasing him down. Before he was king, Saul was the king of Israel. Saul was chasing him down and was trying to find him. Well, Saul went and he, he consulted with a priest named Abimelech and a man named Doag was there and Doag ratted him out to Saul and said, hey, I saw him with the priest over here uh, and he was with these guys. So Saul and Doag ended up going and Saul commanded that the, all all the priests be slaughtered. All the priests of the Lord, 85 of them and their families were all wiped out by this man, Doag. So that's who, who, who Saul's talking about. If you read the subtitle uh, or the, the, the title of the psalm, that's what it's referring to. And that's who he was referring to, right? So, and he's saying, obviously, God's destruction and judgment's going to come upon both of them, which it did. So let's continue on the psalm. I was just setting it up for you because he's, he's setting this up of the evil and the wickedness of these two men and in general. Then look at verses nine, seven through nine. They will laugh and say, look what happens to mighty warriors who do not trust in God. They boast in their wealth instead and grow more and more bold in their wickedness. Let me stop and ask you, is the world growing more and more bold in their wickedness? Every single day, right? We see this playing out just as David said thousands of years ago. They're, they're not trusting in God and they're bold, getting bold in their wickedness. But then look, this is where I really want to turn the corner. Look what David says. But I am like an olive tree thriving in the house of God. I will always trust in God's unfailing love. I will praise you forever, O oh God, for what you have done. I will trust in your good name and the presence of your faithful people. Come on, can we pray over our time in the word? Father, we thank you. Just as I read this morning, help me to rightly explain the word of truth. Help us all to receive this, Lord God, as, as we see, Lord, uh, both Jesus, you use the vine and branches. David's using an olive tree. Help us, Lord God, to understand your word and these illustrations we've used, you've used, Lord God, through uh, King David and even through uh, King Jesus himself, Lord God, help us to receive it and to apply it. Holy Spirit, have your way. Do what you want to do so we can thrive in your presence all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So King David says he's like an olive tree because he commits himself to trusting in the Lord. So it when David says, I will trust in your good name, and I just thought, this is so appropriate. I, I didn't even know Nathan would have that song, I Speak Jesus. Isn't that a powerful song, by the way? You know, but when it means, when, G, when David said, I, I put my trust in your good name, it means to hope and depend on the character of God 
as expressed in his name. Amen? So the name of God is, ex- you know, his character is expressed in his name. Whether it's, it's back then, it was Jehovah, it was Yahweh, whether it's Jesus, right? That's what he means by that. It's interesting that David compares himself to an olive tree. Let's, let's stop and look at trees for a little bit. Why did David compare himself specifically to olive tree? But trees in general are an awesome gift from God, right? Most of us know they not only provide oxygen for us to breathe, but also food to eat, wood for building houses and furniture, pulp for uh, paper, fuel for warmth, and shade for rest and recreation. Come on, how many of you are thankful for a big old cypress or oak tree in the summertime in South Louisiana, right? Just to get up under that thing, right? And they're a great variety. Trees provide natural beauty for us to look at even, right? So, but one of the most remarkable trees is the olive tree. Most of us are not too familiar with olive trees because those are not native to South Louisiana, right? They don't really grow around here. But in Israel, it was and still is the most important of all trees. Listen to this, because it's a source of food, light, and healing. Come on, somebody. Olive trees... Uh, their fruit and the oil of their fruit have long played an important role in the daily life of Israel. For thousands of years, olive trees have been eaten as a staple food. Uh, and even down here, we eat olives, right? Well, you do. I don't eat olives. Uh, olive oil has been used for cooking and, uh, for cooking, used in lamps for light, for medicine, and for anointing all in religious services. Even back then, we've seen the anointing of the oil in the Old Testament, and they would use olive oil, right? These trees are all, uh, always plentiful around the countryside and are known, I love this, for their tenacity. Now you got it. you see how this is bringing together. David's getting chased down by the king of Israel here and he's likening himself to an olive tree because they can grow in almost any conditions on hills or in valleys in rocky or in fertile soil. See, olive trees live for many years and they keep bearing fruit. They can thrive in great heat with minimal amount of water and are virtually indestructible. Isn't that the same word that David used? He said, I will thrive in the house of God like an olive tree. And again, because he was being chased down, falsely accused. The king of all Israel had his army against David trying to kill him. Yet he's saying, I'm going to thrive like an olive tree. He compared himself to this because he understood the power of being connected, as we talked about last week, staying connected to the vine, right? I mean, I've heard so many Christians over the years when I've said, hey, man, how you doing? Or, hey, sister, how you doing? And they said, man, I'm surviving. Well, listen, and I know you've heard it before, but God don't want you just to survive. He wants you to thrive, amen? That's what my wife based the name of the, the women's ministry on, that statement right there, that he wants you to thrive. And David says this as well about his life, right? So this morning, I want to encourage you to be like the olive tree. That's the name of this message. Well, Brandon, shouldn't we be like Christ? Absolutely. But David said he was like the olive tree as an illustration. So I'm encouraging you to be like an olive tree in the illustration that he used. Amen. So I don't want you, you still need to be Christ-like, but this is an illustration and he brings out and I'm, as I'm showing you right here. So be, how can we be like the olive tree? So. Again, I begin to read up on this and think about this. David said he was thriving like an olive tree in the house of God. Well, that's ideal conditions to grow, right? We just read from, from, you know, what, you know, the agricultural uh, specialists uh, say. I mean, I'm pointing to Brother Francis. He's our resident, you know, green thumb man right there, right? And, and we, they can, they can thrive in any condition, but he says, I'm thriving. In the house of God. In other words, in the presence of God or staying connected to God. Well, well, why would David say that? Here's why. Because when we grow in God's presence, it prepares us to thrive in any condition life throws at us. Right? When we thrive here in his word, in prayer, in, in fellowship with the congregation, in life groups, you know, finding your purpose, serving on a serve team, it prepares you for every area. So going back to the olive tree, it doesn't matter what the conditions are, hot, dry, cold, wet, rocky, sandy, the evergreen olive tree will live and produce fruit. Matter of fact, listen, it even says this, it is said that you could never actually kill an olive tree. Even when cut down or burned, new shoots will emerge from the roots. Isn't that amazing? You can cut it down and even burn it. The roots in the ground will still sprout out shoots. I mean, David, they were, David was strategic when he penned those words. He didn't just look around and say, oh, this is the most plentiful tree. I think I'm going to just say I'm going to be like the olive tree. No, David knew exactly what he was talking about when he penned these words. So what does this represent? Well, I believe that he can represent the fiery trials of life, right? 
We all have heat put on us sometimes and a lot of times in life. Cold could represent grief, feeling lonely, right? We got grief sharing coming up, talking every Sunday. You know, we're praying for someone that lost a loved one. Maybe you, you're feeling grief or lonely. That could be representation of a cold part of your life. And then rocky soil. Rocky is when things get tough. Come on, you ever hit a rocky patch in your life? How many say, Brandon, I'm in a rocky patch in my life right now. I'm in a rocky road, right? So see, the olive tree symbolizes faithfulness and steadfastness. In all of these seasons of life, we can continue to produce fruit and flourish if we stay connected to Christ and continue to live in his presence. Amen? So that's what I want to try to encourage you with today. But not only that, not only will, will we produce fruit, as I talked about last week, and be steady, steadfast in every season of life, as David was saying, but we can also help others. Remember earlier I said that the olive tree was a source of food, light, and healing. You remember I said that? So we can help people in these same three ways, spiritually speaking, as to be like the olive tree. We can help people in the same three areas. That's where I'm going to turn the corner and make some application. Yes, I want to encourage you to be like the olive tree. If David said, be like Christ, stay connected. But how do we do that? How do we help people with food, light, and healing? Well, number one, we can offer the bread of life to those that are hungry. I mean, I mean, look, we had a great night Friday night. We fit, we fed about 130 men a bunch of fish and, and, and some hush puppies and stuff. By the way, I want to thank you, serve team, all the cooks out of here. Why don't we give them a round of applause? We had a great night Friday night. Uh, thank y'all for serving. Pa- Pastor Glenn Ducharme did an amazing job. I mean, the altar was full. That was an incredible altar call. Many men got ministered to and prayed for. The word was great, great fellowship. So we offered them some, some real food for the, for their soul. But listen, I'm talking about offering the bread of life. Amen. I'm turning the corner now and, and it's really cool. And I'm going to share in a minute. Pastor Kelly was in this vein Wednesday night as well. So look at John 6, 23 and 35. We're going back to the words of Jesus. Again, he's using an illustration here of himself. John 6, and 35. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw the disciples had taken the only boat, and they realized Jesus had not yet gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where, G- where the Lord had blessed the bread and people had eaten. So you see, they just, they gathered where they had eaten some physical bread. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boat and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, why, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous sign. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Come on, he's turning the corner now. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. Now, he was talking the context when they said, what work should we do? They meant to inherit eternal life. Could you just, he just said, seek eternal life. You know, above that, then he said, what work should we do? He said, the only work to get to heaven is to believe in Jesus, right? That's what he was saying. So I just want to clarify that. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us this bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Amen. When we start talking about food in South Louisiana, all of us, we know about some good food, right? You're going to probably go after lunch, after church and eat a good lunch. But guess what? Tonight, you're probably going to be hungry again. Well, depending on how big of a lunch you have. You may not be, but by tomorrow morning, you'll be hungry again, right? And see, Jesus had already fed them bread. So he starts using the illustration of bread. But he said, no, no, no. I'm not talking about physical bread anymore. I'm talking about I'm the bread of life. That will, that, that will continue to nourish you for eternal life. See, Jesus pointed out there's two kinds of food that we know. Food for the body, which is necessary, but not the most important thing. And food for the inner man, the spirit, which is essential. See, what the people needed was not food for life. They needed life, and, and life is a gift. See, food only sustains life, but Jesus was telling them, I give eternal life, right? 
So this crowd began by seeking Christ, but then they started to seek out a sign from him. They said, give us man. And this is interesting as I begin to study this this week. See, the rabbis of the day taught that when the Messiah came, he would duplicate the miracle of the manna that's recorded in Exodus 16. And that's what they were referring to whenever God gave them manna from heaven for them to eat in the wilderness. As a matter of fact, you saw they, he, they tried to give the credit to Moses, said Moses gave us manna. Jesus said, no, no, Moses didn't give you that. My father gave you that. But the rabbis were teaching when the Messiah comes, he's going to duplicate it. So they knew Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah. And they said, okay, where's this manna that we've been taught? And he said, no, no, you're getting it twisted, so to speak. I'm the bread of life. God gave you physical food thousands of years ago, but now I'm here to, 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 to give you eternal life, right? They thought if Jesus truly uh, was sent by God, that he would prove this again by manna falling from heaven. And his reply was this, the Lord sought to deepen the people's understanding of the truth. Again, as I just mentioned, it was God, not Moses, who gave him manna, and that they needed to take their focus off of Moses in the law and put it onto God. Also, God gave a man in the past, but the Father's now given him the true bread in the person of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus clearly identified that he was the true living bread that came down from heaven. But he came not only for Israel, but for the entire world. Amen? He came not just to sustain life, but to give life. See, seven times in this sermon, the Lord referred to his coming down from heaven a statement that declared him to be God. We know in a minute, I'm going to show you something that you, a lot of you know, but when he said he came, he's the man that came down from heaven, the Jews knew exactly what Jesus was talking about. He was declaring that he was, uh, he was God. The Old Testament manna was, a, again, a type and a shadow of the true bread of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, John 6, 35 contains the first of seven great I am statements recorded by John, which, by the way, these statements are only found here in the Gospels of John. See, God revealed himself to Moses as I am, or Jehovah in Exodus 3. So when Jesus used the word I am, he was definitely claiming to be God. And they knew that. It wasn't just like I am the bread of life. He was using the same word I am, saying that I am God, I am the bread of life that, that is here for you. So this dialogue began with the crowd, again, seeking Christ and seeking a sign, but the listeners soon begin to seek the true bread that Jesus talked about. However, like the woman of Samaria, if you remember the woman at the well, they were not, some of them were not ready for salvation. See, the woman at the well, she wanted the living water so she wouldn't have to keep going to the well. The crowd wanted bread so they would not have to toil to maintain life. Some was truly seeking after the Lord. This is where I'm going to sin and seeking after what they, the, the, the spiritual hunger they had, but some were looking at just the natural. See, there's some people still today that want Jesus Christ only for the benefits he can give. And that's why we see a lot of times we present the gospel, we preach the gospel, we pray with people, and they accept Christ. But again, going back to last week, we never see fruits of salvation because they hear the gospel for the benefits, and there are benefits, but they're not seeking Jesus for who he is. They're seeking him for his benefits, right? Now, other people, now again, the woman at the well, at first she was like, yeah, give me this water so I don't have to keep working here. And then when Jesus read her mail and prophesied about all her their men that she lived with and all the, you know, that a husband she had and the man she was living with, then she truly realized this was the Messiah and she changed her life over to him. See, but there are people around this church that are truly hungry for the bread of life, and we have the awesome opportunity to serve it to them. Amen? Amen. So listen, I want to encourage you. Again, this is where it builds up, and Pastor Kelly was talking about this uh, a Wednesday. He was talking about evangelism and being a light. I'm going to talk about specifically that in a minute, and being a witness. So listen, in two weeks is Easter. Some people are open, only open to come to church on Easter and Sunday. Uh, Easter and Christmas, right? And so listen, just this morning, Anna put the Easter graphic up on our social media platform. So I want to encourage you, if you're on Facebook, if you're on Instagram, go and screenshot this uh, 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 graphic. You can share it. You can, you can uh, like it. And you could can, you can tag people in there. Or you can actually screenshot it and text it to the people to invite them to come to the Easter service. Amen? And it's not just about coming to another Easter service. We're going to offer them the bread of life, right? People are going to have big Easter plans, big Easter lunches, but the most important meal they're going to get that day is when they walk into a Bible-believing church and they hear the gospel preached. Amen? Amen? So I want to encourage you. 
Screenshot this, like it, share it, tag people in it, encourage people uh, to come out to our Easter services so we can continue to present the gospel. You know, again, and now we have our part as well, which I'm a, we can continue further on. Number two, not only do we offer uh, the, the bread of life to those who are uh, spiritually hungry. Number two, we need to shine the light of the Lord to those who are in darkness. We need to shine our light to those in darkness. Remember the, the second point of the, of, of they used olive oil was for light in lamps in Israel. Amen. Before the days of electricity, they would use oil to burn in their lamps to have light, right? Look at what Jesus said. Again, I'm, I'm taking, uh, David's illustration of an olive tree and I'm bringing it back to what Jesus said. You know, I love that. An Old Testament illustration and then Jesus breaks it down for us in the Gospels. Matthew 5, 16, uh, 14 and 16. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp, then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all this to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Again, as I said, they used olive oil to, for, for lamps for light. Jesus likens light to good deeds. This is the way, good deeds are the way we act, the way we talk, and things that we do for people in a selfless way. Amen? In a selfless way. That's that's being a light. He said, let your good deeds. It's, it's kind of like last week we talked about fruit. But our good deeds, are our words, our actions, and things that we do, the way we serve people, those of you that serve here on the serve team or you serve in the community, you know, that's that's letting your light shine. The fruit and character of the disciples of Christ should attract people to Christ. Should attract, how do you know you have good deeds? Well, are you attracting people to the Lord? Is your lifestyle leading people to the Lord? That's how you can tell if your light's shining or not. Is, is people around you that you know getting closer to the Lord or going further away from the Lord? Right? Because just as lights attract, when you turn a light on, people are attracted to light. Everything, right? Even outside, bugs are attracted. Everything's attracted to light. That's how you know. But we're not trying to attract people to ourselves. We're letting our light shine. What does it say? So our Father in heaven will be glorified. But I hope you, you get the gist of where I'm turning the corner. All this, I'm trying to encourage you to, to uh, have a heart of evangelism, not just the next two weeks, especially. I'm trying to encourage you leading up to Easter, but every day of our life, just as Pastor Kelly was talking about, he actually used the Lord's second coming as, okay, what now? Okay, he's coming back, and what now? And that was a couple of his points was how much more urgent we should evangelize because we know Jesus is coming back soon. Amen? So as he talks about the light, you see uh, what Jesus said. I want to go to Ephesians now. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 14. Quite a few verses, but I want to, again, I feel like I need to read them all. Come on, we are in church. It's, it's all right to read a lot of scripture in church, right? Amen. Come on, there's, we, we don't want to have a famine of the word of God, right? All right, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed amongst you. Such sins have no place amongst God's people. Amen? Obscene stories, foolish talks, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Let me just stop there. I think too many Christians get involved in, in foolish talk and coarse jokes. I'm just going to put it out there. Oh, man, I was just joking. I don't really, you know that? The Bible makes it clear. I've seen stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you or for me. Amen? Amen. I'm going to just leave that with you right there. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or, gre impure or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. For a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those who try to excuse these sins, for the anger of God will fall on all who disobey him. That's some pretty strong language the Apostle Paul is using there, right? And he's building up to something. This is what he says. Don't participate in these things that people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the light of the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully de determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible. Amen? 
The scripture encourages us to walk as children of light. I just was reminded when I was a youth pastor, we did something called a blackout night. And I, I preached, I think, out of the same scripture. I was talking about the light exposing. And so, you know, with a black light, uh, you know, if you wear white clothes or whatever, you know, and you turn a black light on, certain clothes, it, it, it shows all the lint all over you, right? And that's the illustration that I was using. We, we took every bulb in the youth room at the time and took out the fluorescent bulbs and turned them into black lights. And I, I preached out of this and said, look, your clothes look normal, but when you turn this light on it, it exposes stains. I remember my wife at the time had to slip out my, my little girl as a game. I remember at the time we had babies and my wife had a shirt on and turned it on. It was like spit up stains on her shirt. Like you, you couldn't see them, you know, because they were clean. And look, Kobe, the mom was like, yep, I know about those days, right? But you see, even that, the dirty stains got exposed under that light. And the Bible's telling us it's the same thing when the light of the, line sh- light of the Lord shines in us and also through us. See, living as children of light means revealing God's light again in our daily lives. By our character, our conduct, we bring God's light into a dark world. God's light should help others find their way to Christ. It's not so we can be better than them. It's like a, it's, it's a light to help them get to Jesus, right? It's not a light to say, oh yeah, look, I'm, I'm this, I'm this saint and you're this sinner. No. It's a light saying, hey, I was where you are. Here's the path to get. To the Savior. Amen. That's what, that's what the Bible's telling us here. According to 2 Corinthians 4, the Bible tells us that the minds of the unsaved person are blinded by Satan. And Ephesians 4 tells us they're blinded by sin. So by Satan and by sin, their minds are blinded. Only as we witness and share Christ can that light enter in. Just like a healthy person can help a sick person, so a child of God can lead the lost out of darkness into God's wondrous light. Amen? We, we said it, uh, Pastor Todd said it, I think a couple weeks ago, there's no greater miracle than when someone becomes born again. When someone gets saved, when someone becomes born again, and as he said, man, this thing is, is wrapping up, as Pastor Kelly said, with Carlette, a young lady, 30 years old, it just reminds us, that young man, 36 last week, it just reminds us, y'all, this is the most important thing we can do is what I'm talking about right here, right? It's to share the gospel, share the truth, let our light shine. Light reveals God, light produces fruit, but light also exposes what is wrong, right? No surgeon would willingly operate in the dark. What surgeon would ever try to operate on somebody in the dark? What, what artist, what painter would ever try to paint in the dark? Tony, would you try to paint one of your portraits in complete darkness? Absolutely not, right? He said, well, I might. <laughs> it probably ain't gonna come out as good as the ones I've seen, right? <laughs> so, right? But I mean, you need light to see what you're doing. John 12, 46, Jesus said, I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. See, when Jesus was here on earth, the perfection of his character and conduct exposed the sinfulness of people around him. This is one reason why the religious people hated him and wanted to kill him because his, his light was exposing that they were, they were religious frauds. They acted religious. They, they had all the, the, the pomp and stance, so to speak. They were wealthy. They had all the respect of everyone. But inside, Jesus said they were like rotted out graves. And that's why they wanted to kill him, because he came to shine the light. See, we can expose the darkness and sin around us just by living like Christ, not by verbally accusing or condemning people. Okay, a couple of y'all got that. We got to speak the truth in love. Not condemning and, 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 you know, chastising people, right? Yes, we need to, we, uh, we, we need to call the, the, you know, a spade a spade. But when we live our lives, you know, the way Christ, going back to last week, we stay connected and we produce fruit and we shine the light. People automatically get convicted around us. You know, I'm just, I'm just reminded there was a guy I used to work for and I was painting and, and I just got saved. My wife and I were engaged at the time and this guy was, um, uh, this guy was just like, you know, cursing up a storm and talking about all kind of worldliness. And it was just talking, getting to know him. First day he was working with me on a job. Uh, and then I, and we started finding out about our personal lives. And, and I said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm engaged. I'm going to be getting married in a few months. And he said, okay, that's great, man. He said, well, where do y'all live? And he, I said, well, my, my fiance lives with her grandmother and I live down the road, uh, in, in a house that I'm, I'm, you know, we're renting from her mom that we're going to move into after we get married. And he stopped and he looked at me and he said, you're a Christian, aren't you? I said, I sure am. He's like, oh man, that's, that's awesome, you know, just because he knew because we weren't living together. That brother went from cursing at lunchtime, he's blessing his food, you know, it's just not like, you know. I didn't, I didn't tell him anything except that my wife, my fiance and I wasn't living together, right? But that's just a great example. Just he knew my lifestyle 
convicted him of his sin or made him act like he was more holy than he really was, right? But I didn't have to tell him anything about his cursing and all his stuff he was talking about. He just asked me about my life, and I just let my life shine, amen? And it's the same uh, with, with all of us. Now, in Ephesians 5.12, Paul gives us a caution. He said, be careful how you deal with darkness. When it comes to exposing the filthy things of, of, of the world, darkness, be mindful. Listen to this. Be mindful that you don't unconsciously advertise or promote sin. Look what it says in Ephesians 5.12. Paul says, it is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. I heard this quote. I love this. Somebody said, it's not necessary for the believer to perform an autopsy on a rotting corpse to expose his rottenness. All he has to do is turn the light on. Amen. So come on, let's offer the bread of life to those that are hungry. Shine the light of the Lord to those in darkness. And then number three, help heal the hurting. Remember in Israel, they would use olive oil. And still now there's essential oils even today that I'm sure even here, you know, I don't know for sure, but I know in Israel, they would use olive oil to make medicines and to help heal people's wounds. Well, we know there are a lot of people who are dealing with not only physical, but all kind of emotional and mental, maybe marital wounds, right? Luke 418, this was our, our, um, our text for the Living Free series, but I want to read it again in New King James. The, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus speaking, reading from Isaiah 61, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. We know that it's ultimately Jesus who heals people, right? But the scripture tells us that he uses us in the process to heal and comfort people, right? We know that from a couple scriptures, James 5, 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Now, Brother Glenn used this scripture um, Friday night as well, and a lot of times we use that for physical healing, and obviously it's true, but in the context of people that are all around us that are hurting or hopeless, next week I'm going to talk about bringing hope to the hopeless. How many of y'all know someone personally that's hopeless in your life? You know somebody. There's people all around you that, that seem hopeless. You could see it all over the news and Facebook or Instagram. People are hopeless. I'm going to share that uh, to, to encourage you to do that next week. But we can bring hope and healing to people. Why? It says, confess your sins to one another and pray for each other so you may be healed. Look at what the next verse says. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. You know, just this week, the Lord shined the light. I've used that scripture probably a hundred times, a lot of times for prayer and fasting and in context of prayer. But what it's saying here is that our prayers are powerful. They help heal people. Isn't that right? Isn't that what it's saying? If we confess our sins and you, and you pray for one another, it can help in the process of healing. The Lord wants to use you and me in the healing process when we pray for people who are hurting. Do you believe that? I mean, how many times have you walked through something? And there's all these families today we're praying for that are, that are going through grief. How many of you have lost someone and you were hurting and you, people in the church told you, man, I'm praying for you. And you've either heard or you felt like, man, it's like I could feel the prayers of the saints right now. You've ever, you ever sensed that? Like you knew people were praying for you, right? People were telling you that, but you just knew there was a grace upon your life. There was a peace upon you. Most of you are shaking your heads, right? How many of you can say, I could, I could understand that. Raise your hand and say, I felt the prayers of people without them even, not even, you know, like you just sense. And when I say feel the prayers, cause you're like, man, there's such a grace on me right now to walk through what I'm walking through, whether physical illness or grief or maybe going through marital or relational issues, right? God helps heal us and bring comfort uh, 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 through other people, through their prayers, right? And, and through experience. One, this has become one of my life scriptures. I share it at every funeral. You've heard me share it a lot. Here, 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. Come on, how many of y'all are thankful God's merciful? Amen. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. See, one purpose of suffering is to qualify us as Christ's servants to enter empathetically into the pain experiences of others. When we suffer, it qualifies us to be empathetic. You know, there's a difference between being sympathetic and empathetic. You can sympathize with someone from a distance, right? You empathize with someone when you, go on, when, when you went through exactly what they're going through. You, you get into the mix with them, right? And that's what Corinthians is saying. God will comfort us so we can comfort others in those same troubles when they go through it. God's going to use us to help comfort and heal the hurting. 
Again, this has shown true in my life time and time again, and I'm sure it has in your life as well. You know, I don't ask anymore why bad things happen in my life. Because I've learned over the years that I know at some point, somewhere down the line, I'll be in a position to be used by God to help heal and comfort someone else. Amen? You know, there was someone very close to me. I hadn't even encouraged that brother yet. But there was someone very close to me that told me they went talk to another brother and went talk to him and asked for prayer. And when I talked to that that young man later, and I said, man, I noticed, you know, you didn't come down to the altar call, whatever, but I saw so-and-so praying for you. He said, yeah, well, I just, you know, I wasn't comfortable going in front of everybody. But he said, you know what? He said, I, 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 I trust this guy, and I know he's been through a lot and a lot of things that I could relate. So I know he could relate to me. So he went up to that brother to get prayer. Amen? And that's what it's all about, right? He, people recognize and understand. It's one thing when I say, man, you know, oh, I, I've caught myself and somebody's going through something and I was like, oh, yeah, I understand. I'm like, no, I don't. Actually, I don't understand. I don't know what you're going through. I, I could, but there's other times where I can look him in the eye and say, man, I know exactly what you're going through, right? And so, man, that's what's so beautiful even about CR. There's a saying, I don't know if they all still use it, God never wastes the hurt. Is that still a tagline, right? And that's so true. God never wastes the hurt. When we go through pain, you know, look at it as an opportunity one day to be able to be like the olive tree and help heal other people through the Lord's grace and comfort. Amen? So again, as we close, I want to encourage you every day, of course, gearing up towards Easter, I want to encourage you. People are way more open to the gospel and coming to church. Offer the bread of life to those who are hungry. Shine the light of the Lord for those in darkness and help heal the hurting by praying for them, being there for them, empathizing with them. And God said, as he comforted you, he's going to comfort uh, others through you. Amen. As we wrap it up, as we close John 6, 29, let's go back to this. Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants you to do. Believe in the one he has sent. Now, remember, the context was he was saying that don't spend your time trying to find bread, natural bread. Spend your time seeking eternal life. And he said, well, what works must we do basically to enter eternal life? And he said, this is the only work God wants you to do to be saved. And that's to believe in the one he sent, which obviously he was talking about himself, Jesus. Now look later on in John 6, 47 and 48, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. That word believe, just as it is in John 3, 16, and just as Paul says it in Romans, means to trust. It's not just to believe with head knowledge. It's to trust and to surrender your life to Christ, to surrender your eternity to the Lord. Amen? Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning as we conclude? Again, you know, I've used all the illustrations, but man, two weeks in a row, two people in their 30s suddenly pass away. Brain aneurysm and car accident. doesn't matter how old you are. Man, life is precious. Life is short. Another funeral today, right? Whether you're older, younger, healthy, we all driving cars every single day, right? It could happen like this. Are you prepared? We know it just brings us such comfort to know that Colette gave her life to Christ and that she's in glory. What if that was you, though? What if you got in your car today and you didn't make it home? I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to be morbid. I'm just trying to bring reality. This is the reality, right, church? This is there. If you're watching from home today, we're not promised tomorrow. If you say, Brandon, if, if, if today was my last day on this planet, man, I don't know if I've believed, if I've trusted in the bread of life, in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says we've all sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. The wages of sin of death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus because he died on the cross and he paid you and I sin debt. If you say, Brandon, I'm not sure if I'm right with God or where would I spend eternity? But I want to be sure today. I want to surrender my life to Christ. If that's you, just slip up your hand today. Say, Brandon, I, 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 need, to, I need to believe. Over here to my left. See you over here, this couple. Praise God. Anybody else? Over here by the sound booth. Young man, I see your hand. Amen. Anybody else? Say, Brandon, I want to give my life to Christ today. I want to surrender my life to Christ. Even if you're watching at home, I can't see your hand, but the Lord can. Just acknowledge it. It's something to sign of surrender to. You're lifting your hands up to the Lord and saying, Lord, I surrender. Again, as I said earlier, we're not just praying a prayer here. This is just the beginning. This doesn't end it. This just starts your journey and your life as a disciple of Christ. Come on, maybe you say, Brandon, I was once walking with the Lord, but I've walked away. I see your hand there, young lady. And you say, I've walked away, you know, I've turned away from the Lord, but today I need to re-surrender my life. I need to give my life to the Lord again. That's you, just slip up your hand and say, man, I need need a fresh relationship. I need to renew my covenant and my relationship with the Lord this morning. Ma'am, I see your hand. Anybody else? 
Anyone else? Come on, we're going to pray together. Now let's all pray together. The Bible says if we believe in our heart, again, that word believe means to trust, confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, is which we're going to celebrate in two weeks, you will be saved. Amen? So let's pray that right now. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me and thank you for dying in my place. Lord, I know that I've sinned. And Lord, I repent of my sin and I turn to you. I surrender my life to you. And I declare that you are my Lord and Savior. Lord, give me the grace and the strength to live for you all the days of my life and to be a light to all those around me. In Jesus' name, I pray. And everyone said, amen and amen. Come on, can we celebrate with these this morning? Amen. Hey, if you made the decision for the first time or first time in a long time, there's a card in the chair right in front of you. It says connection card, fill it out. Or maybe it's a little bit off to the side. There's one in every other chair. Watch it online, connection card. Click on that link. We'll send you a Bible. You can fill out the one here and we'll bring it to the info center. We'll give you a Bible, some materials we want to pray for you. Why don't the rest of us stand up? And come on, how many of y'all want to, want, to, want to be like the olive tree and offer the, the bread of life and be a light to people around us and be used for, for God. Come on, how many of y'all? Let me see your hands. Say, Brandon, I want to be that light and uh, to shine bright in our community. Come on, church. There's a lost and dying world all around us, and we need to be the light of, and the truth and offer the bread of life to those that are hungry and dying around us. Come on, let's all pray together. Father, would you help us? Just as David said that he wanted to be like an olive tree. Lord, we know we want to be like Christ. Lord, Christ, like as we talked about last, we connected to the vine. But as the illustration David used, Lord, we want to thrive even in the toughest conditions of life, and we want to be like God, offer the bread of life, uh, to the eternal life to people around us. Help us to shine our light bright, to expose darkness, not to take part in, not even to talk about it, the Bible says, but to just shine our lights with our, our, our actions, our words, by serving, Lord God, and help us to pray for those, and Lord God, bring comfort to those that are hurting and need hope, Lord God. I pray you just continue to use us, prepare us in a mighty way, Lord God, and every day to glorify you, that many souls may come into the kingdom today, tomorrow, next week, Easter Sunday, and the days ahead. In Jesus' name, we pray and everybody said amen and amen well look hey god bless you and look do me a favor don't forget maybe before you leave go on our, our facebook page our uh, instagram grab that in uh that image that graphic and invite people to easter in two weeks we love y'all have a great day